Um, welcome everyone. I wanted to introduce um, my friend Ambassador Vernon Penner, who is our diplomat in residence um, at Virtual State University. He has been instrumental in bringing Ambassador Kaplan here today. Thanks to his effort, we are able to uh, welcome Ambassador Kaplan today. And first, uh, uh, Mr. Penner will say something. Uh, thank, thank you very much, thank you so much. Um, I really serve and have served for the past couple of years under the umbrella of the um, Institute for International Engagement, the, uh, our center, which uh, where Wing Kai So is our academic director. And uh, I've been grateful for the opportunity to be here for the last few years. But more than that, I'm grateful for the opportunity to say Panasonic, that's an interesting logo up here. Uh, we don't really need that. Um, the uh, grateful for the opportunity for Ambassador Heflin to join us this afternoon. Uh, you know, it isn't often I get the privilege to help in the introduction for somebody I really believe in. <clears throat> Mostly in the diplomatic world, you oftentimes are speaking about people. You know, it's okay. It's a can-do job. You kind of pump it up, etc. This guy doesn't need any pumping up. What's nice about Ambassador Heflin is. You know, he's walked the walk in order for him to talk the talk. And when you look at his record uh, of what he has done, the awards he has received, where he has worked, he brings to Cape Verde both a regional expertise, an expertise in East and West Africa, and Latin and South America, speaking Spanish and speaking Portuguese, as well as a functional expertise to his job. His job as a program manager, his job as a director, his job as an ambassador, and his job in dealing with a variety of issues, economic, political, military, security, etc. So I'm not going to, I won't trouble you with the details. I know Dr. Winkaito will do a lot better than I do, but uh, I'm really privileged if we could all give Dr. Heflin, Ambassador Heflin, a hand. I think um, the importance of this lecture is partly because of the close relationship between southeastern Massachusetts and Cabo Verde. And uh, as we know, the immigrants coming from Cabo Verde have come to this country for over a century. And our economy in the local area is deeply connected to um, this African nation. And Bridgewater State University has had a very close relationship with Cabo Verde thanks to our former president. Uh, Dr. Dana Mordefaria, who was very instrumental in developing relationship with Cabo Verde. And we know that now we have a lot of students coming from that country and also a lot of local residents from that country to visit us and to study here. And um, I, we, it's our honor and privilege to welcome the community members who attend today and also the students in uh, this class of Africa who is coming to this uh, lecture. I wanted to thank Dr. Louis Badien, who is the, our coordinator of the African Studies Program. Uh, herself is a Senegalese um, American and, and coming from, uh, from Senegal, but has been teaching it. Um, and uh, of course, uh, Ambassador Van Panner is bringing the people here, uh, uh, Ambassador Haflin here. I also thank uh, Dr. Joao Rosa, uh, who is the uh, director of the Institute of Capital Verse. Uh, studies. Um, as uh, Vernon said, I'm the John Quincy Adams Foreign Affairs Distinguished Speaker Series is a lecture series that is intended to offer insights about our international relations uh, between the United States and the rest of the world. And I think Africa is a continent that is increasingly important, but it's always overlooked. And I think we need more education and understanding of the continent of Africa in general and Cabo Verde in particular. Um, so I, this, in this spirit, I'm really excited to have Ambassador Haplin here. And as you see from the bio a little bit, so he has had 30 years of diplomatic experience beginning from 1987 and all the way until today. And he has served in many, many different countries. And I could just name the countries without the title. And he has served in Peru, India, 
Mexico, Zambia in Africa, uh, served as the uh, Rwanda, Burund Burundi, um, United Kingdom, uh, London, in London, um, and served uh, several terms at the Bureau of African Affairs, uh, as first as the Deputy Director and then as the Deputy and Acting Director of both the African Regional and Security Affairs and the Office of West African Affairs. And, um, and before he started the post in Cabo Verde, he also served as the Principal Officer uh, in a Council General in a city in Mexico from, uh, for four years as well. Um, so he has had extensive experiences in both Africa and Latin America. And um, he has become, he is the ambassador of Cabo Verde since 2015. So uh, about two years now, right, ambassador. So um, this is a perfect time for him to tell us a little bit about both his personal experiences and about his ideas about our relationship with Africa. And please join me to welcome Ambassador Donald Hatton. All right, thank you, Doctor, and thank you, Ambassador Penner, for your kind remarks. First, I want to thank Bridgewater State University and President Fred Clark and Dr. Wen Kai To for having me here today. Bridgewater State is a leader in engagement with Africa in general and with Cabo Verde in particular, and your efforts are greatly appreciated. I can't overstate the importance that your institution has had on the archipelago. The University of Cabo Verde is full of Bridgewater State graduates, and you're probably the best known American university down there, more so than Harvard or Yale or Stanford. Also, let me take this opportunity to recognize Vern Pinner, who still holds the record for being the longest serving United States ambassador in Cabo Verde and is very well thought of there. It would be impossible for me to give the John Quincy Adams talk and be this close to Quincy and Braintree without talking a minute about John Quincy Adams and his son Charles Francis Adams. John Quincy Adams was Secretary of State of the United States in addition to being President. And if you're a fan, as I am, of the show Madam Secretary, when they're up in, in her office suite and there's the oil portraits of all the Secretaries of State up there, John Quincy Adams is one of them. Uh, but more than that, John Quincy Adams was a boy when his father was uh, in the delegation to Paris and later minister to London and was a secretary to his father and then was requested by one of our first ambassadors to Moscow to be secretary of the legation there. So in many ways, he was one of the first American foreign service officers. But his son, Charles Francis Adams, is a hero of American diplomacy. Charles Francis Adams chose not to go into politics. He made money. And then he was asked to be the candidate for the anti-slavery Free Soil Party, which was a predecessor to Lincoln's Republican Party. Got beat pretty badly. But when President Lincoln took office in 1861, he asked Charles Francis Adams to serve as ambassador to Great Britain. And he had a very, very important job. His job was to keep Great Britain from joining the war on the part of the Confederacy. And he performed brilliantly. He, um, he constantly lobbied British decision makers, members of parliament. He engaged in what we would now call public diplomacy by getting out among the British people. And he turned an international incident over the seizure of the CSS Alabama. Basically, the Union Navy seized the Alabama in contravention of the law of the sea, uh, thus angering the British Royal Navy. Into, he, he turned what really could have been a challenge into an opportunity, the way he handled it the way the U.S. submitted to international arbitration, paid up a fairly large sum of money promptly when it was told to, uh, really bought time and really persuaded British decision makers that the Union government was somebody that they could work with. The Alabama incidentally darts in and out of Cabo Verdean history. It pulled into Cabo Verdean ports a couple times, and we have records of a Cabo Verdean American sailor uh, who served on the Union ship that seized the Alabama. And in fact, for those of you who don't know it, we have found records of at least five Cabo Verdean Americans who fought in the American Revolution almost 250 years ago. And as the 
population in New England got bigger and bigger, there are increasing numbers with each war that goes by, and a good amount of Cabo Verdeans served in the Union Army and Navy, especially the Navy, and then v very much distinguished themselves in World War II and Korea and Vietnam as, as ground soldiers. And during World War II, and something that you have to be a real history buff to know about, which is uh, the Merchant Marine. And basically, we put guns on civilian vessels going between here and London carrying war materials and a lot of Cabo Verdeans served in the Armored Merchant Marine. Uh, I personally think Charles Francis Radham, Adams ranks with uh, Lincoln and Grant and Chamberlain as one of the individuals who were indispensable to the Union's victory. Uh, one problem with Adams is that when young people ask me sometimes, what's a good book I can read about what it's like to be a diplomat? Almost every Foreign Service officer I know has a copy of John Kenneth Galbraith's Ambassador's Journal on his shelf. I often recommend Stacy Schiff's great book about Ben Franklin's time in Paris, getting the French to join us in the Revolutionary War. This, uh, Joseph Grew's Ten Years in Japan, uh, in which Grew says that the first job of a diplomat is to maintain the possibility of peace instead of war. Even if his, his government decides to go the path of war, the job of a diplomat is to leave the door open to peace. And there's been some really interesting work done by David McCullough and some of his young associates recently on Elihu Washburn, who was our ambassador to Paris during the Prussian invasion of 1870 and who saved many, many lives. There's not really a good book on Charles Francis Adams. So if any of you are a budding um, historian or writer, that may be a good opportunity for you. And all the papers are just up the road at Braintree. Okay, uh, now to the topic at hand. When we talk about Africa, we first realize that we're talking about a huge continent with incredible variety. I don't think a lot of Americans get this. I think even some Africans who have spent time only in their own country don't get it. Uh, how many people know that 1.2 billion people live in Africa? Okay. I think it's safe to say the cultural, political, and economic differences between Mali in the north and South Africa at the tip of the continent between Somalia in the east and Cabo Verde in the west are greater than those between, say, Mexico and Chile or Portugal and Poland. I started to count how many languages are spoken and I, I gave up. But there are four main European languages plus a variant of Dutch, plus Swahili, Arabic, numerous others. There's much diversity even within Cabo Verde. As many of you already know, there are, already, there are several distinct forms of Creole in addition to Portuguese. Whether we're discussing the finer points of Barlovento Creole, the variations of Congolese hip hop, or the geology of Namibia, I think it's safe to say the diversity of Africa is virtually without limit. It's also virtually unknown to many people living outside the continent. What do most outsiders think of when the term Africa is mentioned? Uh, unfortunately, the term Africa prompts many people to think about problems, famine, disease, child soldiers, illegal poaching. I don't want to sidetrack too much here. We could spend all afternoon on this, but some of this is no doubt the result of the massive declines we've seen in recent years in international journalism. Uh, many great newspapers now don't have overseas bureaus, or they try to cover Africa from London. Only a handful of U.S. news organizations now operate bureaus on the continent, meaning the little news we do read about Africa tends to focus on only the most acute problems. You might have read about the Ebola crisis, but once the disease was contained, I'm guessing you didn't read about the resilience of those communities. I'll give you a for instance. Um, when I was on West African Affairs, the question came up as to whether, as HIV moved into Nigeria, whether we should trust the Nigerian health system to distribute the anti-HIV drugs or do it ourselves. And I helped make the call that we were really talking about people's lives here and we couldn't take national pride into account. We were just going to have to do it ourselves through the Center through Disease Control and their contracting partners. Fast forward about six, seven years, Ebola comes, Nigerian health system handled it brilliantly. I might have been wrong about the HIV drugs, okay, I admit that now. But they did a very competent job of doing all the right stuff it took to keep Ebola from getting into Nigeria or spreading if it did get there. Clearly, the challenges and opportunities facing Africa vary widely. Let's take a look at both. Health is still a challenge, uh, despite the success I just mentioned in Ebola. In many African countries, hospitals are woefully inadequate. 
Famine was recently declared in South Sudan, and the same could happen in Nigeria and Somalia this year. Africa has this, particularly West Africa, has this fascinating international thing called the Famine Early Warning System, where they look at all kinds of indicators like rainfall and heat and the number of locusts and whatever, and try to predict if famine's coming this year or not, and if so, where and when, and do a really good job. And they're saying Nigeria and Somalia have got problems. However, the president's plan for AIDS relief, PEPFAR, uh, has done wonders in keeping HIV-positive people in the workforce and preventing further spread of the disease. West African countries did a great job of controlling the Ebola outbreak, and Cabo Verde did the same with Zika. Zika was basically a one-year phenomenon in Cabo Verde. However, life expectancy has gone up from 47 to 60 years old in 40 years. By the way, Cabo Verdeans have increased their life expectancy from 50 to 74 during the same time. We're not sure if it's genetics, diet, or laid-back lifestyle. I'm kind of hoping the last two, since I've been benefiting from them the last couple of years. <laughs> the child mortality rate in Africa has gone down over 50% in 25 years, and maternal mortality, at least in parts of Africa, including Cabo Verde, is now down to levels uh, that you see in Europe or Africa, uh, Europe or America. Again, there are massive variations in these numbers. Cabo Verde had an infant mortality rate last year, 22 deaths per 1,000 births. But next door in Guinea-Bissau, it's 87 deaths per 1,000 births, and a life expectancy of only around 50 in Guinea-Bissau, according to the World Factbook. For the record, Cabo Verde was experiencing deadly famines just a few generations ago. In 2014, there was no rainy season in Cabo Verde, and Cabo Verdeans held their breath when there was no famine and no need for massive outside food assistance, Cabo Verdeans rightly saw it as a sign of a mature government and economy. And I remember I got there just a few months after this, <coughs> after the rain was skipped, and it was pretty dry. And people were, older people were just astounded there was no famine, because back in Portuguese colonial days, there would have been a famine and people would have died. For those of you who are studying political science or public health, take note, I like to use this example about Cabo Verde to illustrate the importance of good governments and politics. Cabo Verde's leaders have done an excellent job of focusing their, focusing their limited resources on health and education, and we're seeing the results of this today. Uh, former Prime Minister Jose Maria Neves, who was here at Bridgewater recently, says, good governance is our petroleum. And that's their good governance and human resources are what Cabo Verde has to sell. One thing is both a challenge and opportunity. The median age in Africa is 19. Seventy percent of Africans are under 25 years old. That means a lot of people coming into the workforce every year who need jobs. But it also means Africa has a large resource, young people at its disposal. And those young people are increasingly urbanized. Forty percent of Africans live in urban areas now, projected to rise to half by 2030. Unfortunately, Africa as a whole doesn't invest enough in education, Cabo Verde being the exception that proves the rule. The percentage of African kids enrolled in elementary or secondary school has gone up over 50% in 25 years. Last year in Africa, we received 62,000 applications for the 1,000 Young African Leadership Initiative, YALI slots. You guys hosted the YALIs last year here, and you're going to do it again this year. Study tour slots for this year sign of how hungry young Africans are for travel, education, and to engage with the rest of the world. Africans' perception of their economic situation is another challenge. Pew Research recently said that over 70 percent of South Africans and Nigerians say their economies are in bad shape, and 50 percent of Kenyans say the same thing. Cabo Verde consistently gets good ratings on corruption, but opinion polls show that significant numbers of Cabo Verdeans perceive more corruption. Transparency International reported in 2015 that 58% of Africa said that corruption was getting worse, and 22% had paid a bribe sometime during their life. African Union estimates corruption costs Africans $150 billion a year. This problem disproportionately affects young people because one of the most pernicious forms of corruption is nepotism and the doling out of limited jobs to the elites leaving many talented but politically unconnected young people in the dust. What happens when massive swaths of a society are effectively cut out of the job market or prevented from using their intelligence in a productive way? This brings me to my next point, conflicts and terrorism. Boko Haram, al-Shabaab, and al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb make life insecure for millions of Africans. 
The good news is that sovereign countries aren't fighting each other and indeed are cooperating in the fight against terrorism. We saw this recently in the Gambia where neighboring African nations worked together to ensure a democratically elected government could finally take power. It's a win for Africa and for Africans. Women are a huge opportunity for Africa. They continue to be ignored, underutilized, and overlooked in many nations. Only 8.5% of African workers earning wages in the non-agricultural sector are women. Only 51% of women above age 15 can read and write. The U.S. government's working to get more girls in school and we're building networks of human entrepreneurs. Remember I said the numbers are low for women working outside the home for wages where you see a lot of women working as self-employed entrepreneurs, selling vegetables, selling goods they baked um, or fried up, and we're trying to help them learn how to grow their business, to make more money, and to hire people. And frankly, as I go around to university level audiences in Cabo Verde, women are already starting to dominate numerically. When women are fully engaged in the formal economy, it will be like Africa discovered huge reserves of petroleum. When I walk around the streets of Praia, the capital of Cabo Verde, or especially in the little villages, it's obvious who's doing most of the work. I'm particularly proud of the work we're doing in Cabo Verde to stimulate economic development by empowering women entrepreneurs. Mind you, this is beyond a moral or philosophical question about gender equality. Scores of studies show that by helping women to enter the formal economy, it can make a massive difference in boosting a country's economic output. Statistics are pretty clear worldwide. If you have a country where young women graduate high school, go to work, wait a few years before they get married, and wait a few years before they have children, that's all. Both they individually and their family and the economy takes off. If you have women who aren't allowed to do that, the economy stays stagnant. In Cabo Verde, the U.S. has the Millennium Challenge Corporation. We love acronyms, so be MCC from here on out which has invested $165 million in infrastructure programs, including one program that's connected thousands of homes to sewer and water, which they pay for. And we're no longer seeing women spending an hour or two each day hauling jugs of water. It's turn on a tap in the house, which we take for granted. They don't, uh, the Cardinal recently said, uh, we, the, cardinal, the, the Cardinal Bishop and I were out in a village uh, cutting the red ribbon on one of these projects. He said, this is a revolution. He said, you can't, I can't tell you how many people my age in Cabo Verde grew up without water in the house. And with that extra hour or two we're giving them back, they are working and are helping kids with school or running a small business. Uh, just last month, I cut the ribbon on a small copy shop that's run by women who are blind. People want to work to be productive, to give a comfortable life to their kids. MCC has done a good job of identifying and tackling economic bottlenecks like this. In recent decades, U.S. government programs like MCC have centered on making opportunities for Africa, such as the African Growth and Opportunity Act, which enables African businesses to export to the U.S. duty-free in many cases. If you are a country that participates in the African Growth and Opportunity Act and you fully participate in it, which has been a challenge, it's basically 70% as good as being in a free trade area. 70% of the products on customs list of stuff can come in duty free. There's money to be made by American businesses in boosting two-way trade and investment in Africa. Africa's growing integration into world markets, improving infrastructure and youth boom make Africa very attractive. Investors doing business there are enthusiastic. McKinsey says that by 2025, Africa could double its current manufacturing output put from half a trillion dollars to a trillion. GDP in Sub-Saharan Africa has grown from $170 billion to $1.6 trillion in 40 years. Uh, doing the math, that's a little over $1,000 a person. Cabo Verde is on $3,700 a person GDP, which is phenomenally high for Africa, particularly considering they don't have any petroleum or minerals. The percentage of young people living in extreme poverty has dropped from 56% to 41% in 25 years. The current GDP rates are anemic. They're about 1.6% continent-wide in 2016, and we see the same in Cabo Verde. This is partly a symptom of the big crisis here and in Europe of 2008. Uh, Africa just hasn't recovered from that. Another area where MCC has been making a difference by focusing on some fundamental infrastructure and investment climate problems, we're starting to see positive changes. Thanks to the U.S. Praia and Alza Modern Port, 
where products can be traded and the country's prime geographic position can be leveraged. We're in the midst of clarifying land titles for the country. This sounds a little policy wonky, but stay with me here. Imagine you own a home, but you don't know where the exact boundary is. Or maybe you have a long lost cousin who claims the home belongs to him. Are you going to invest a bunch of your hard earned money into turning your home into a hotel or making basic improvements? Of course not. These small actions add up to a big weight hung around the nation's economy. So let me brag a bit here about the smart approach we're taking. We not only make it easier for mom and grandma to leave the home to work, not to mention make the home safer and cleaner with a sewer system, but we're making it easier and more clear for families to invest in their property. It's a huge changes, and I would argue worthwhile investments. Africa and some of the problems we mentioned earlier might seem far away, but we all know how interconnected the world is today. That's one reason we're seeing more emphasis by the U.S. and other partner nations like Germany, England, Portugal, and Brazil to work with African nations on joint security challenges. Problems like international drug smuggling and human trafficking don't respect borders, but international criminals look for weak states to hide. We've been working closely with Cabo Verde in recent years to help them combat money laundering, illegal fishing, drug trafficking, and piracy. Our sailors, Marines, soldiers, and airmen train side by side with their Cabo Verdean counterparts. We've conducted major joint training and military exercises together in the past two decades. Many of the country's top officers have trained in the U.S. We've even received police training from departments in the Boston area, and I hope to see more of that this year. Let me talk a bit about democracy. It's thriving in Africa. Country after country are seeing peaceful handovers of power and back-to-back -back democratic elections. Cabo Verde has held free and fair elections like clockwork every five years since 1970. The five, with two major parties largely alternating in power and stretches in which the parliament and presidency are in different parties' hands since 1990. A recent Afrobarometer survey shows that 67 percent of Africans say democracy is preferable to any other form of government. Afrobarometer also tells us that most people in every African country see the U.S. as a development model to be emulated, ahead of China and always ahead of the former colonial power, whoever that is. Another good sign is the strengthening of African organizations such as the African Union and ECOWAS as institutions and internal partners. Um, I was in African Affairs when the old Organization for African Unity changed into the African Union, and we kind of wondered if it was just going to be a name change. No, it's a real organization. It does really good work in terms of peacekeeping, diffusing situations diplomatically, um, working with the UN and other and various countries to try and concentrate resources where they're needed in a crisis. I mentioned earlier ECOWAS's work in bringing uh, former President Jame of Gambia to accept the 2016 election results and leave the country. It's first rate. And I can't tell you how many elections I've been to where the U.S. Embassy and either ECOWAS or the AU are the only international observers. The U.S. government, through a program I helped start, has trained over 300,000 peacekeepers for AU and UN African peacekeeping missions. Like all of us here today, Africans value democracy. The Internet is penetrating throughout Africa. Twenty-five years ago, most African countries had one node for the Internet, mostly at a university provided by the United States Leland Initiative, named after the late Congressman Mickey Leland. Today, young people whose parents never had a landline phone much less a computer or Wi-Fi in their home, have smartphones and are using them. Every town square in Cabo Verde now has Wi-Fi. Facebook and Microsoft are looking to the continent and to Cabo Verde specifically as the frontier for new Internet users. How could you personally make a difference in Africa? If you're a student, social service trips. Doesn't always have to be about the beach when spring break comes around. If you're near graduation, think about the Peace Corps. If you're a little older, think about joining a Habitat for Humanity style group or do medical work like Beth Israel Deaconess Hospital does or go with a church group or maybe join the Foreign Service. You'll be glad you did. We haven't yet shared this with the press yet, but we soon hope to be welcoming student volunteers from the U.S. to Cabo Verde through ASEC, A-I-E-S-E-C, the world's largest student volunteer organization. Check out ASEC.org. And I encourage you to keep a close watch on their website and be part of the first group of American volunteers. Trust me, you'll enjoy Cabo Verde. Make sure you let us know when you arrive and stop by the embassy. A little goes a long way in Africa, and your talents, whatever they may be,
can really be put to good use. I'll tell you a story. I had just arrived in Zambia. I was about 34 years old, and I was at a party at the ambassador's house, and this uh, woman who was a Zambian Supreme Court Chief Justice walked up to me and said, oh, Don, you're an attorney, right? I said, yes, ma'am. And she said, I, you're the only American attorney here in the embassy, right? And I went, yes. And she said, we've got a problem. Our national airline is getting ready to bankrupt. And we basically inherited whatever the laws the British left us on independence in 1965. And our bankruptcy laws and our security laws are about that thick. And we're getting ready to receive a bunch of sophisticated court filings from creditors and other airlines and all kinds of people our airline owes money. We're not going to know what to do with them. So I went back to the embassy, and uh, we had a meeting, and we came up with a really low-cost, low-tech solution because there wasn't high, time to do high-cost and high-tech. And we started bringing American lawyers and judges and other experts over to help them beat uh, their system of laws into shape to deal with the modern world. And it culminated for me, we had a, uh, one of the problems AMIA had was they inherited the law from the British that the British would never enforce today. The British law said that if you insulted the king or queen, it's called Les Majeste, and you went to jail. And the Zambians, along with some other African countries, had translated that to if you insulted the president of the republic, you went to jail, criminal libel. And I happened to be a minor league expert on the U.S. law on the subject, the case of New York Times versus Sullivan, uh, which basically in the early 60s uh, did away with this. What was happening was in places like my native Alabama, uh, when organizations like the New York Times would accurately cover what was going on in the civil rights movement, then some of the local officials would sue the New York Times and Alabama court and win $100 million and try to put the newspaper out of business. So the U.S. Supreme Court decided you couldn't do that anymore. It was the case of New York Times versus Sullivan. And I was driving around uh, listening to the radio one day, and the Zambian Supreme Court had adopted New York Times versus Sullivan as the law of the land, thus ending criminal libel. So that's, you know, just somebody walking up to you at a party and initiating a conversation, you, you can do things like that. Uh, another example, um, and I'll, uh, I'll never forget this. I... Um, was asked to be an observer at Nelson Mandela's election in 1994. And there were a lot of Americans there as observers. And, you know, election observation is something we do around the world. We know how to do it. But I've never seen anything like this. There had been a right-wing terrorist group had been blowing up bombs. And uh, there was a lot of fear that on election day they might blow up bombs or machine gun lines of people waiting at the polls. And, and that threat was out there trying to suppress voter turnout because they figured if they could make the vast majority of people not turn out, then their candidates would do a little better. And I happened to walk from my hotel to the embassy in Pretoria that day. And I'll never forget seeing lines of hundreds, thousands of people of every different ethnic group lined up to vote. They, it was the first time they'd had a truly fair election in South Africa, and they just weren't going to be told no. So, you know, again, army of little, and I, I met a lot of the American volunteers, and some of them were famous, like Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton, but some of them were just plain folks who came down to be observers for that election, which turned out to be completely free and fair, and uh, not only elected Nelson Mandela, but elected some really sharp people to their parliament. Last, let me say, whenever I talk to groups of young people overseas, the question and answer period turns, period turns pretty quickly to visas. How do I get a visa to go to the U.S. and work or study there? Which I take as a great compliment to the U.S. Whenever I speak to a group here, the questions often turn to, how can I get in the Foreign Service or work in international affairs? Which I take as a compliment to the way of life that Vern and I have chosen. So, uh, as we move into questions and I've actually surprised myself by speaking at least 20 minutes. It's very rare for me. Um, but we've got plenty of time left for questions. So you want to ask me about Cabo Verde, about Africa, about careers in international relations? Go ahead. All right? Anybody? I'm going to start calling on people at random if you don't ask. Question? Right over here. Uh, 
As you was talking, there is like this bad perception about Africa because most of the people that live outside, uh, they just hear things, but they were not there to see what's going on. What do you would say for people like Americans and people that want to explore Africa, where they should start or how to have like some information, I want to go to this country, but I hear a lot of bad things about this place, what can they do? You've asked a really good question because I'll tell you a big, problem America has, and it's a strategic problem for us, our young people, not just our young people, don't travel enough overseas and they don't learn languages. I go around, um, when I speak to American audiences, particularly when I was down on the Mexico-Texas border, I speak to Texas audiences, and young people would come up to me and say, um, Consul, can you give me some job advice? I, I don't think, I don't know if the Foreign Service is an attainable goal for and I always say, well, you're speaking pretty good English to me. Do you speak Spanish? Oh, yes, I do. So you speak two languages. Well, you're golden then. So few Americans do. I said, if you, if you don't have any better idea, take a criminal justice degree. Because law enforcement is hungry for people who speak two languages. Business is hungry for people who speak two languages. Think about trying to be a realtor here in Southern Mass without speaking Portuguese. Right? Think about working in a hospital room in New York City without being able to speak Spanish. Uh, you can't do it. So uh, one thing I would say is that we need to get more Americans to travel overseas. Europeans are much better about it. And we need to get more Americans to learn a language. And really, when you're in high school, you know, high school and college, I was, I was about to say, I, I left this out of my prepared remarks, but I had a lot of fun in college. I went to a small college, roughly like Birmingham Southern. And there's so much to do on campus. You know, there's, there's parties, there's mm -hmm. concerts, there's probably a film series. I don't know if you guys still do that. Um, there's art exhibits, there's all this stuff that's free right here on campus. Well, another thing that's free is foreign language. In fact, your advisor has probably been pushing you to take a foreign language. If you want to go to grad school, they've definitely been pushing you to take a foreign language. You have the same opportunities in high school. Really, every American kid. Now, some of you are pre-med and are like scared to death making a B in something. It's got to be all A's. Okay, maybe skip it. But other than that, um, Everybody should take foreign language when they've got the opportunity to take it for free. And one thing we found in the foreign service is it's very hard to predict who's going to be good at it. it it's, there's no talent. I could take a kid from a you know, fairly poor urban high school somewhere and put them in their first language class, all of a sudden they excel. I can take a kid who had a really good private school education, they're not so good. It's really hard to say. And if you can learn a language, and especially if you learn, turn out to be one of these people that can easily learn two or three languages, you'll never be without a job. But if we could get people learning languages and traveling overseas, I think they, we would have a better sense of what is Africa like, what is China like, what is South America like. So, back then, uh, Jeff, you So what quality do you think is the most important when becoming a diplomat? Like what's the most desirable quality? Curiosity. I would say that if you talk to foreign service officers of any age, people who have just come in, people who have been in 10 or 20 years, you'll find that they're very well read, that they've done a lot of reading on countries they'll probably never go to, uh, periods of history. I just read a book on Edward the First for no good reason I can think of. Okay? But um, this has actually, I think, become a little easier in the internet age. If you're the kind of person that when you get on the internet in the morning, you got your favorite little sites you go to, and then maybe you read the Boston Globe or the New York Times or the Washington Post, and you're clicking on interesting stories from around the world, or the BBC website's very good, Associated Press, whatever. Um, that's the quality we need more than anything else. Because in international affairs, you meet people who burrow down and specialize in one area, but it's really more common as people float around the world. My hometown has a, not a big city by any means, but it has a Fortune 500 company. And several of my friends made their bones by being their international representative in places like Brussels and Moscow and stuff there. Because the companies literally couldn't find anybody else who were willing to go live overseas for a few years. Right? Yes, back there. Um, when they called me for this event, I was really excited because I want to learn about Consular Fellow Program. Okay, good. I did apply. I have my test model. I don't. I have no clue what's going to be in the test. 
on Googling. <laughs> I just want to go for curiosity. If I can make it tomorrow, I'll go a year later because I've been reading how long you can go back. And Are you taking the written test or the oral test tomorrow? The writing test. All right. Good. Vern actually wants to talk for a few minutes about the consular fellow programs before we leave. Okay. But let me say this. Our written test for all the various parts of the Foreign Service vary a little bit from year to year. But what they have in common is they're a, they have a combination of knowledge, what you already know, and aptitude. How would you be if we gave you this situation about people or this situation about managing a situation? Um, one thing I say to people who are thinking about entering the Foreign Service is go ahead, take the exam, uh, even if you're not ready yet, because they are a little different from the ACT or the SAT or the GRE. And a lot of people, okay, I'm an example. I failed the written test the first time by one point. <laughs> I passed the written test the second time by, anybody want to guess? One point. And now I'm a U.S. So um, go ahead, you know, if you're interested at all, go ahead and take it. Uh, the way it works nowadays is it's kind of a rolling basis. You sign up at career.state.gov, you go to an electronic test center, you take the test. And then the oral test is a little wacky too. So I'd say if you're thinking, I wouldn't even come into a European, you're doing the exact right thing. If you do great tomorrow, great. If you don't, you can take it again. Yeah. All right. A year later, so. I guess this was curious. I've been checking into federal and state job. Um, I just want to go like <laughs> do anything I can, either federal law or state job. So I found that select. Seems interesting. They're looking for people speaking Portuguese and Spanish. Well, why do right. I take advantage? What well, I don't. well, I'm going to steal some of Vern's thunder. He has a, a written handout. This consular <laughs> fellows program is really interesting for a couple reasons. You've heard a lot about proposals to cut the budget in Washington, the hiring freeze, and everything. In the president's second, I think, executive order on immigration, they specifically said the State Department consular fellows program should be expanded if possible. Now, what is that? Um, when we hire in the Foreign Service, we hire basically in two categories historically. One is generalists, like the interim, political, economic, consular officer, and whatnot. And uh, we move around the world and we do different jobs, each tour, and it's, it's nice. But we also hire specialists. We hire uh, people to be security officers. We hire people to be human resources officers. We hire people to do our accounting. And they do the same kind of, still move around the world for the same kind of job. Consular Fellows is a new wrinkle added. We added a few years ago. We found out that we could not find enough speakers of Portuguese, which is important because of Brazil's growing economy, and Mandarin Chinese. Now, and then we found out that we couldn't find enough people who spoke Portuguese, even with a special program. So we bring in some people who speak Spanish, because we know we can train them pretty quickly to speak Portuguese, or they can take the job of a young diplomat speaking Spanish so we can train the young diplomat to speak Portuguese. So the point here is, how many of you, raise your hands on this one, Speak Portuguese or Spanish or Mandarin Chinese at a decent level. Yeah, you should look at the Cosmo Fellows program. <laughs> I don't know, you've already got a big job. But, uh, <laughs> you should look at the Cosmo Fellows program. Now, the way it works, it's, it's a little scary when you first look at it, it says you, the one year renewable turns up to five years. Here's a little inside baseball. Almost everybody, unless you, unless you kill someone on the front steps of the embassy, gets up to the five years. And historically, people who have done well over five years who want to come in as a generalist, consular officer, are allowed to. So you go into it with, well, maybe I'll just do it for one to five years and get on my resume, but I don't like being away from home that much. That's great. But if you want to stay and do the same kind of work I've done, you can do that too as long as you do a good job. So it's a great program. Um, my assistant, graduate assistant, George Lina, had some similar experiences. Would you mind sharing that? So, oh, yeah. yeah. So your, I served in the Peace Corps in Mozambique for two years. Yeah. It was awesome. Um, and um, I don't, what, what should I share? Yeah, you were um, a Spanish speaker. Still, and then I, how did you get I got, into that? I spoke Spanish, and within about three months, I spoke Portuguese fluently. Um, 
I did take some Portuguese classes here at Bridgewater State before that. I was horrible, I hated it, and I thought I'd never actually be good at it. Um, but after the two months, three months training at Peace Corps, I was pretty fluent, which is the same training that you get, or right. um, the same training that you get as a consular fellow or an embassy worker. And I will say, if you if you took languages in high school or college, you just kind of did okay, but you, you felt like maybe going two or three times a week for an hour and not really studying, pretending you were studying, but actually <laughs> watching the SPM. Um, wouldn't cut it for you. I was the same way, but going the way that she and I did, where you take it all day, every day for months. That's I learned Spanish in six months. I learned Portuguese in four months. Now. Brought up an interesting point talking about Peace Corps. <coughs> we have people in the State Department whose job is to recruit for the Foreign Service only, or the State Department more generally. Uh, I don't, they don't pay me to do that, so I actually like to recruit for international affairs. The State Department or Foreign Service is not a good answer for you. Um, I'm happy to talk to people about other agencies in Washington and hire people about work that's available in the NGO community or the private sector or church groups. So I do this for every college group I speak to. Let me give you my email address. I'd be happy to hear from any of you. You just say, hey, I was at your Bridgewater State talk. What can you tell me? What I usually do is I ask a few questions about you and your experiences, and then I have a standard skill that I adapt to you and send back out, and that starts conversation when we go back and forth. But there's a lot of opportunities in there. And when you're young and single and don't have kids, and you're mobile, that gives you an edge. Uh, if you've already got a language on your belt, that gives you an edge. And you know, once you get into it, you either decide you love it and you want to keep doing it, or you'll decide that was boy, that looks great on my resume, but I'm kind of tired of this. It's Heflin D L H E F L I N D L at state.gov. Bern, did you want to say a few Yeah, let, let me segue you onto this. Besides thanking you for your remarks, um, and talk a bit on this consular fellowship program, which is only announced really last year and just starting to come up now. Um, it is like the Peace Corps in that it's you know a short period of time, a couple of years. Actually, they look for five years for two tours. But let me tell you what differentiates consular fellowship from Peace Corps, and I read this at the end. You get similar benefits to those who enter in the Foreign Service, which means a competitive salary, paid housing for you and your family while serving overseas, and the opportunity to receive a recruitment bonus and to participate in student loan repayment. That's exactly right. Now, I, I don't know, but I guarantee you one thing as in compared to the Peace Corps. You're not going to be living in some hooch in Binh Din province to say anything about my days in Vietnam, okay? You're going to be living in a reasonable place, and you'll have a place for a reasonable family. So this Council of Fellowship program, I think, is the next best thing to slice bread. I, you I, get in. I, I agree. I agree completely. Without waiving this so-called written exam, and, and let's face it, Don and I are this, we're not rocket scientists. I mean, somehow we got in, and, and let's face it, there's probably a float so that the year I got in, they needed a lot of people. <laughs> but in any case, um, this consular program is already tailor-made for those of you who are bilingual. And I mentioned Arabic, Mandarin, Russian, Spanish, and Portuguese. Not bad. How about really? students who are not bilingual? Well, when I say bilingual, they test actually at a 3-3 three, three level, which is, right. and you can explain that better than I can. Um, what we want, we divide our languages into five parts. Uh, five is you pretty much grew up overseas and you speak it fluently. Four is you're pretty darn good. Three is what we're looking for. Three is taking me to just speak a language, sending you to school four to six months, training you up to where you can speak and read at a fairly professional level. Uh, interestingly, they don't really care if we ever learn to write it or not. <laughs> so, <laughs> so don't worry about that part. Now, let me say, since Vern and I are talking about the Consular Fellows Program, since I'm a Consular Officer, let me tell you what Consular Officers do. Consular Officers help Americans travel overseas. That's our number one job. 
we go visit an American who's been arrested. Uh, we help an American parent whose uh, ex-spouse kidnapped a kid and took them to a country. Uh, and then we also, many, some of you foreign students have been on the other side of this. We uh, talk to people who want visas to come to the U.S. to visit or for work or study. Uh, we talk, we help adopting parents adopt their foreign baby. And uh, on the visa side, I can tell you that um, I only been overseas about two months in Peru, and I had kind of a moment. I interviewed this kid and was admitted to Harvard, great SAT scores. His family could pay for it. And I thought, you know, I have pretty good SAT scores. There was one college in the country I definitely could not have gotten into. That was Harvard. Here I am stamping the papers for this kid to go to Harvard. Probably changed his life. On the um, consular side, the story I always tell is when I was in Mexico, there were an awful lot of uh, American citizens, that really Mexican. Sorry, I'm a citizen. What you saying? Who had moved back over to northern Mexico and were living there. And sometimes something would happen. Mom and dad would get in trouble. Maybe dad had passed away or was absent and mom died in a car away or got put in jail or something. And so you had this little American citizen. And the question for the Mexican court system, just like the U.S. court system, is what's the best solution for the kid? What's the best place for them to be? And the answer was often with an auntie or an uncle who lived in the U.S. So auntie and uncle could come down. Well, not always, because sometimes they weren't exactly legal in the U.S. So if they stepped into Mexico to pick up their little niece or nephew, they could go back. So I used to ask, the, you know, I always ask one of the young women, take uh, the little kids and walk them to the middle of the International Bridge where Texas Social Services can pick them up and take them back to make sure they're not going to come. So you can make a real impact on people's individual lives and consular work. And political or economic work is very larger. We do our work on a peace process. We do our work on the country's economy. We're having a good day. I think of the day we really feel like we've helped a bunch of people. And the consular work, you can feel like that day that you really help the family get back together, or a little kid wind up in the right place for them, or a young college student wind up in the right place for them. I think we can all say that America is well represented in Praia with the Mouse of yeah. And I'm sure all of us would agree to that. And I might say, I fortunately share one other thing with him as being uh, enamored with the Foreign Service, is that both of us were directors of the U.S. Visa Office. Right. And there certainly couldn't be one thing you understand better in Cape Verde than visas. Anyway, a round of applause. Thank you very much.